Okay, we're good. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks everyone. So uh, as today is uh, sadly my last day, uh, I'll be talking about uh, the research I've been doing uh, over the course of the internship. So within the last uh, 12 weeks, uh, in particular, looking at uh, the relevance of uh, grid cell representations to uh, object recognition in a visual uh, domain. So the kind of motivation for this research was uh, that I was really interested in these uh, papers from Numenta that came out last year, looking at how um, grid cells uh, could be used to um, uh, enable uh, robust object recognition. And in particular, uh, enable a uh, sensor to integrate information uh, over various locations. Um, and so in this uh, paper from Marcus, uh, this was uh, kind of shown with these uh, synthetic objects. Um, and given that my background is in uh, kind of more vision, I was interested to see, could this actually work on uh, a visual task, one with images, in particular, a kind of classic machine vision uh, task, such as um, the MNIST digits. Um, so that was kind of uh, the sort of starting motivation. Um, but putting this in the uh, greater context of uh, kind of machine learning and AI, if, um, if you imagine a, a situation where uh, the input uh, to a sensor is too large for it to be processed all at once, all in parallel, uh, as, as would be the case, for example, with an embodied agent um, that is uh, sequentially applying uh, a sensor such as a, a camera or an eye um, to the environment, then, uh, then you need to sample that space somehow. Um, but uh, the kind of challenging uh, part of this is how you integrate the information across those samples. Now, um, most kind of uh, uh, leading systems, uh, such as a recurrent neural network, if you were to uh, feed it image patches, um, in order for it to perform well, the, the sequence that you follow would have to uh, be the same during both training and testing and on every time that you want to apply the system. So in this case, you would start in this top left corner, for example, and do a raster scan across the image. But obviously in this case where you're trying to spot the tiger hiding uh, behind the bamboo, uh, that's not gonna work very well. Um, so the, the kind of, what makes this uh, approach interesting is that the uh, capabilities of grid cells to encode in, uh, location and to path integrate means that a sensor can follow a, uh, an arbitrary uh, sequence as it samples features uh, from the input. Um, and this has uh, the potential to uh, essentially kind of break the, uh, the system from the, uh, the constraints that are, are typically imposed. And so you could imagine if this was combined with uh, an agent that actually controls its um, motor um, outputs, then you could, for example, uh, sample this input in a principled way. And you, know, you might see this part first and then uh, very quickly um, identify what's in the image. So that's, that's kind of the, the key motivation from the, the machine learning side. From the neuroscience uh, point of view, it's, um, there's been a lot of focus in the kind of uh, for many years now in how uh, primate vision can be modeled, particularly with parallel systems. So, uh, for example, interest in how convolutional neural networks uh, may capture some of the uh, computations that our uh, ventral stream performs in object recognition. Um, but there's been comparatively uh, less focus on how our visual system is able to integrate information across uh, samples from the environment, which in our case is uh, across saccades and uh, the uh, leveraging of attention. Um, uh, so uh, we know uh, that that's- I'm gonna oh, introduce, briefly, have we reviewed this paper? As, have we, uh, we, we did, yeah, we did last year, I think. Uh, okay, I don't remember that image, so I'm just trying to- okay. it, was in the, it was in the paper. I mean, it was quite a small uh, part of the sub figure. Sorry. Um, that's right. But um, yeah, but, but of course, we know that this is how we uh, experience the world. And so we, there must be some uh, mechanism for us to integrate this information. Um, but uh, at the moment, th this uh, remains an open question how our, our brain does this. Uh, the kind of concept of uh, cortical uh, grid cells and uh, object reference frames uh, provides a uh, neuro, uh, neurologically plausible solution. 
Um, but beyond kind of Numenta's uh, interest in this, uh, there's been uh, interest elsewhere in the literature, notably from uh, Neil Burgess uh, in this paper last year, um, also suggesting that uh, grid cells might be involved in uh, something like visual recognition. Uh, an important caveat um, is that, uh, so they, they developed a model that was able to um, be fed in an, an image of, for example, a face, and then recall that face. So essentially, uh, memorize an image and uh, recognize that same image um, if shown again. But uh, the system uh, wasn't tasked with generalization. So given a series of examples of, say, a particular um, uh, digit, a, can, it, uh, can the system recognize a novel example of that uh, digit? So that was um, a kind of uh, limitation in the literature that uh, I was aiming to address with this work. Um, because if that's possible, then that uh, provides further support that um, the brain might actually use a system like this um, in, uh, in solving these uh, tasks. So it's worth just kind of um, mentioning a bit uh, why this kind of interest in grid cells. I appreciate this is familiar uh, to many of those listening, but uh, for anyone uh, who's less familiar with this. So uh, grid cells uh, fire with these uh, regular patterns of activity uh, as uh, typically uh, an agent travels through space, but also uh, in this kind of theoretical framework as a sensor travels through uh, space. And so by uh, looking at the activity of um, a given grid cell, uh, there is some information about where the sensor is located in space. But clearly uh, this information uh, is inherently ambiguous. Uh, what's uh, quite, um, Useful, however, is that a combination of grid cells, so different grid cells have different scales and different orientations, and a combination of these can therefore uniquely encode a particular uh, location in space. Uh, but in addition to this encoding um, capability, uh, grid cells are able to update their uh, firing uh, with self-movement, so perform path integration. Uh, and this means that uh, information about where a sensor is moving to uh, can also be uh, encoded robustly. And so um, in, in previous work from Numenta, it was discussed how this uh, beyond navigation uh, could be used in, for example, sensory motor uh, object recognition. And of course, this is a natural, um, this can be naturally extended to uh, visual recognition. <clears throat> and so the, the idea here was to actually uh, look at this, um, see whether this is possible on a uh, visual task. and um, so the, the kind of the systems I'll compare to are more traditional machine learning methods, such as recurrent neural networks uh, and k-nearest neighbor. Um, uh, but before I kind of get into uh, the results, it's worth talking a bit more about the actual uh, system that was implemented. So this uh, builds entirely on um, previous work uh, from published work from Numenta, uh, and in particular, this uh, cortical column network where uh, the system follows a sequence of, of receiving some uh, motor input, which uh, can update the location representation. This, uh, the kind of location representation can then predict uh, the sensory input uh, that is likely. The sensory input uh, is then received and uh, together with the prediction changes the representation here. And then the sensory um, representation can update the location uh, representation. And then this can, um, process can continue iteratively. So uh, adapting one of the figures from uh, Marcus's paper, this shows how uh, this kind of approach can be uh, extended to not just recall a given object that was seen before, but actually generalize to unseen examples. Um, so if you imagine that you're uh, looking at this um, uh, nine, uh, and this is an example that you've never seen in the training set, but you have seen many other examples of nines uh, and have learned the associations between the location representations and the uh, sensory features, as well as other digits, for example, zero. So at the beginning, uh, this system uh, receives kind of uh, motor input. You can imagine kind of moving to the first feature, but uh, as there's uh, no information about where it is on the object yet, um, the kind of nothing really happens at this point and there's no prediction for the sensory layer. The first sensory uh, uh, input arrives, uh, and because there's no prediction, uh, the columns that are activated um, become active um, 
indiscriminately. Um, and so the, uh, the kind of century representation is essentially consistent with a multitude of digits um, that might be represented by that feature. So for example, both a nine and a, a zero have a, a, have a similar uh, feature at the uh, top. This then uh, predicts um, a, where the kind of object is, uh, where, where the feature is um, in, in that object reference frame and uh, gives the kind of location representation. So um, the kind of uh, uh, idea here is that um, one believes one is either at the kind of the top of a nine or top of a zero, um, but one is unsure uh, which of these is the case. The kind of key step then is to provide another movement. So in this case, moving to the bottom of the image. Um, and in this case, the uh, grid cells will uh, path integrate. Uh, and importantly, uh, given these new location representations and the uh, learned examples of nines and zeros in the past, they will predict uh, different uh, things in the sensory layer. The kind of sensory information is then provided, but this time, um, because some of these columns, or some of these cells rather were correctly predicted uh, and some were not, uh, the uh, activity is sparse. And in particular, uh, in this case, the activity is consistent with uh, a subset of the uh, different examples of nine that have been learned in the past, um, but does not um, contain uh, examples of uh, any other um, learned uh, digits. And so classification, at this point is considered successful. So the, the representation, although it uh, may still be in a sense uh, ambiguous as to exactly what this uh, nine is, is it closer to one learned instance or another in the past? Um, the, the kind of key feature is that it is, um, is exclusively described by um, the union of uh, that class's learned representations and is not a subset of the union of any other class uh, representations. This uh, algorithm has uh, kind of two failure cases that are possible. One is that uh, the system uh, does converge to uh, a subset of uh, another class's targets, um, in which case the, the system has misclassified, uh, or uh, the kind of other failure cases that the system never um, converges to a single, um, uh, to a, a subset of any uh, target representation. So it always remains in kind of this ambiguous territory. Uh, in which case it uh, fails to classify the, the input. A kind of natural um, issue that one might uh, expect in this situation is that as the kind of number of learned examples uh, grows, then the, uh, the union of location representations um, uh, grows as well and, and can potentially um, jeopardize the, the kind of sparsity of the, the system and therefore its ability to um, perform as it should. Uh, in practice, as long as the uh, kind of the dimensions of the uh, grid cell modules, for example, were set um, at reasonable uh, values, this wasn't something uh, that I ever encountered. The, the limitation in on training on more examples was actually due to just the, the wall clock time of uh, training this system is, is generally fairly slow. Um, but, um, but yeah, but that wasn't an actual problem that I ran into uh, personally. Can I, do you mind commentary as we go along here? Yes. Not at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is this has been a sort of a bugaboo for us for a long time. This issue about unions only worked up to a certain level, and I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, or something. I don't think we've ever really analyzed this completely. Uh, but my my intuition is that as long as you maintain some level of sparsity in the union, you're going to throw away a lot of information. Like you you can't form a union of too many things, but the system won't settle. Uh, but if you keep sensing over time, eventually uh, you'll hit a combination where it, it does settle. I don't think we've ever proved that. It, it's sort of like in your picture of the tiger in the woods, like you can scan over that and, and for a long time, you won't see what it is. I didn't see it right away. <laughs> um, but then you hit some features which are sort of unique, more unique. And uh, those features then lead to a better sort of union um, and then you can settle, right? So. Um, I just pointing out that this is good. I don't think we've ever done a proper analysis on this, but it's good to see that in your experiment, you didn't run into it. Well, in, in both yeah, the columns I, I, and columns plus papers, we explored that a little bit, like how long does it take to converge to a completely unique representation based on how many features it's learned and all of that stuff. But there's always going to be some 
kind of limit, particularly if these grid cell modules are small. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't, my, my recollection is we never really pushed that limit. You know, so we, we in the papers, if I recall, and I, I may recall wrongly that we, yeah, we only we pushed were, it within the context of this particular yeah, uh, network and saw where it broke up. But we, yeah. in, in some research meetings, we talked about um, other ways we might be able to do unions, like maybe time multiplexing some of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, know, you know, I just so, point out, so. I, I don't think we've ever really concretely nailed it down. I, I'm not worried about it, I'm just saying it's an interesting area. I'm just reminding myself it's an interesting area. Yeah, one, one thing to mention, so I did um, just kind of out of curiosity, I did shrink the grid cell modules to see if I could kind of break the system in this way. Um, and of course it is eventually possible to, to do that, but I guess, and I don't have any specific numbers on this, but what was interesting was that I had to get closer to where the kind of, uh, the, uh, the actual capacity of the system met the, um, the kind of maximum possible capacity. I'm not sure if I'm wording that clearly, but but essentially the, the proportion of uh, cells that had to be active and kind of uh, in order to sufficiently obscure all the information was higher than uh, I was expecting for the system to start failing. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, but, quick um, question, quick question. Uh, yeah. So uh, how many uh, scales of the grid cells did you, uh, did you find that you needed? Um, that's I mean, a how many, question. how I'm many not. modules? I think that's a question. How many different modules? Is that what you mean? So, so, so modules, uh, it was, uh, 40, 40 different modules that I used, uh, with 50 by 50 cells in each. Um, okay. and, so, and I found so scaling, scaling the size of each module was the most important factor for enabling it to learn more, uh, objects. We don't okay. believe that's a realistic number. I mean, that's too high. Uh, at least I don't believe it is. But on the other hand, I think the two-dimensional nature of grid cells, I think is, is a, a, some, it's, it's likely to be a, uh, an artifact, and, but not reality. I, I mean, the, the, the theories I've been working on the, and we've been discussing over the last couple of years is that perhaps grid cell modules are really path integration in 1D and, and that what we see as a grid cell module is a, some sort of a 2D projection of that. Um, so I think that's another area. There's no way, like for example, there'd be 40 modules of grid cell modules in the entorhinal cortex, for example, that uh, as far as we know, that would be combining this way. But I think it's okay to go forward as it is right now. I'm just pointing out that from Kevin's question, it's, it's this is a, we don't think this is actually, it, it's really slightly different than we're thinking about it here. It's the same idea applies. It's, it's nothing wrong with the idea. It's just that uh, requiring 40 grid cell modules of 2D like we see them does not seem what's going on in the brain. So I think there's a lot of 1D grid cell modules. Um, can I, keep going. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I add a quick question? <laughs> to the, so, uh, wh why do we have to reach a stable representation? I mean, uh, isn't it possible that we just keep some sort of running union or we just threshold and um, not just take a regular union, but threshold just the most uh, common examples or the mo most common active units instead? Why uh, do you mean? Do you mean for for the target or for the that it's been compared to, or for the actual? Uh... No, no, for the union because Jeff said we don't, we never achieve a, a stable represent. We don't know how many uh, samples we need to achieve a stable representation. But it seems to me that we'll never achieve a stable representation, right? Why do you say we wouldn't achieve a stable it, representation? It, it, it often does. It often uh, converges to one. Uh, I think it, I think it would. I mean, your perceptual uh, re, uh, experience is that you settle, you make a decision. You know, it's like the it's like the example of the vase versus faces that uh, that's common. I use that in the book, right? You don't you can't see them both at the same time. They're both consistent with the data, and so in theory, you could have a union of vases and faces. Here, you could have a union of two different digits and say, well, I see both a four and a five, but um, but you don't. Your your brain picks one at the time. It wants to settle on something. It doesn't, it doesn't seem that we keep two things, we, we perceive two things. It's like the system wants to settle on something. Well, but in a, in a continual learning scenario, I mean, the, the environment's usually uh, non-stationary and if the environment's non-stationary, then I mean, you, don't, you don't assume you ever have stable representations. Those representations are gonna be evolving with time. So as you see new samples, that union's gonna change. Well, when we say a stable world, I mean, if you're looking at a particular thing and trying to learn that thing, then in theory it's stable. If you're if you're 
uh, if I walk into a room, I look at the furniture in the room, I can build a model of that room by looking at the different be features of the room. If I'm, uh, if, if I'm, things are flying back and forth in front of me, I might, I mean, I, 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 it's not gonna be stable if I'm looking to the left and I see some trees and I look to my right and I see some buildings. No, it's not gonna be stable in that regard, but it'll be stable during the trees and it'll be stable during the buildings. I, I, I'm not sure, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, Lucas. But mm -hmm. it, it seems like you know it's a very dynamic system. It's stable while you're while you're perceiving a particular object or a particular thing, um, mm -hmm. and then it quickly goes on to the next one. I mean, it could be stable for just a couple hundred milliseconds in some sense until you attend to the next object in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the the uh algorithm from the uh kind of grid cells point of view from the the column uh point of view but to kind of take a step back uh this um approach in, assumes that the the features that are being input to the system are uh sparse distributed representations so binary vectors that are uh sparse uh and so in order to apply this to uh an image uh data set like mnist uh it's necessary to actually extract um these SDRs. Uh, and so the, the approach I uh, took, which um, yeah, I kind of discussed later, it's, you know, obviously has its limitations, but essentially was to uh, train a uh, convolutional neural network end-to-end uh, -end on a, a subset of the MNIST data set. So uh, 54,000 examples, which are uh, not used uh, later for any uh, tasks um, to perform classification. Uh, but this uh, CNN has a K winner take all uh, layer that enforces uh, sparsity. Um, after training is complete, uh, the kind of images uh, that are going to be uh, fed to the other classifiers, so both grid cell nets, the, the network being uh, shown here, but uh, being shown in this kind of presentation, uh, and also the kind of uh, comparison classifiers, K nearest neighbor and our, uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, the images for those classifiers can be passed through the, the system after training. Uh, and the K winner uh, take all activity extracted and then binarized, at which point uh, you have uh, an SDR. Um, naturally, this leads to some loss of information, but in practice, I found that a linear classifier fed uh, these features could uh, achieve 99% plus accuracy on MNIST uh, and that a decoder could accurately reconstruct um, the input images. So uh, in practice, it didn't uh, appear to have um, significantly uh, affected the amount of information. And just to kind of show a bit more concretely what uh, this might look like in practice. So the <clears throat> this K winner take all layer is a five by five uh, dimension of grid, uh, roughly corresponding to the 2D um, uh, shape of, or the kind of 2D uh, regions of the uh, input image. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is that, uh, the, so the K winner take all is, a play, is applied channel wise. Uh, at each of these uh, locations. Uh, and the after kind of binarization, this means that there are 25 uh, SDRs that can be fed as uh, features across this 2D grid. And so all the, the kind of classifiers, uh, the idea is that they receive a sequence of inputs corresponding to one of these SDRs um, at a time. And then in the uh, task that I'm evaluating, in the kind of the basic task, which uh, we expect all the systems to, to handle without issue is uh, to follow the same order through this uh, space of 25 uh, samples on every example, both during training and learning uh, on every, uh, training and testing on every image. Um, but in the kind of more challenging task where it's predicted that only the kind of grid cell net uh, will be able to um, perform well, the sequence that is taken through this space uh, is arbitrary. It can change uh, for a given training or testing example. Um, just as kind of a side note, it's worth noting that uh, in order to um, kind of optimize the performance of uh, the downstream classifiers, in particular the grid cell net, uh, it was necessary to uh, optimize this, uh, these sparse distributed representations. Uh, and in particular, the the entropy essentially. So uh, how many of these cells are active at some point um, in this representation? Um, so kind of 
so what I'm showing here is um, so the duty cycle is uh, essentially the proportion of uh, time that a cell is uh, a winner in the K winner take all algorithm. Um, and so uh, a kind of target duty cycle can be set. This is the desired <coughs> um, duty cycle for each cell. Um, and this can be, um, cells can be pushed towards this duty cycle using the boost strength, which uh, biases cells to either uh, surpass the, the threshold for K winner uh, or to, to fall below it. And so what you see is that kind of with minimal uh, tuning of this, many of the cells uh, are never active. Uh, and so, although the, the representation is uh, sparse and it's binary, it's not actually particularly distributed. Um, but by um, kind of aggressively increasing the, the boost strength, uh, it can be ensured that uh, most cells participate at some point for a, uh, in a representation. Uh, and in practice, it was uh, found that this uh, significantly improved uh, performance. Uh, so then the kind of the main result then is, uh, as mentioned in the kind of the basic task, there's a, a fixed input sequence that is uh, of these features that's given to the classifiers. And the, um, the setting that um, I'm looking at here is uh, few shot learning on these um, and this digit. So uh, anywhere from one to 20 examples of each class are being uh, fed. Um, and in addition to uh, the K nearest neighbor. So the, the recurrent neural network has uh, a mode with both only one epoch of training and 1000 epochs of training. The reason for the one epoch of training is because the um, K nearest uh, neighbor and the, the grid cell net essentially observe each feature uh, for a given um, example only once uh, and perform, uh, in the case of grid cell net, uh, a single up, uh, weight update for that feature. Um, so it's a, a few shot task, no, not only in terms of the number of examples that are given, but also how much um, essentially learning time is available to uh, actually uh, encode um, these, uh, these representations. Um, uh, oh, and one other thing to mention is, um, interestingly, this is actually already, uh, you, one would expect the RNN to perform uh, better than it does, but one of the, the limitations is that uh, for the RNN is that, as mentioned, the although the the sequence through the space is fixed, it isn't a uh, kind of raster scan across the image. Um, and what this means is that a lot of the kind of local uh, dependencies are uh, broken, and so the the kind of basic RNN that we um, use here uh, already struggles with um, with that. Even so this is a, that's a fixed, a fixed but random sequence. Is that what it is? Is it like okay? We're just yeah. So essentially, if you randomly initialize a sequence yeah, and it. then use yeah. that same sequence every time, so individual then, inputs would not typically be next to each other. Therefore, the, you just exactly. Would, yeah. Okay. But but does that matter you, to the RNN? Why would that matter? Uh, because it needs to um, learn uh, long range dependency. So uh, between, if if you imagine kind of. Um, oh, I see. It, this, okay. is, this is where having something like yeah. an LSTM would, would probably uh, help. Um, I didn't actually try a, a, an LSTM. I mean, the correlation, the help, correlation but... between even on a single digit like five, the correlation between the upper left part of the image and the bottom right part of the image is going to be less than you know two adjacent segments. So it's just hard to find the dependencies, right? Isn't that the interpretation? Yeah. So I, I you know, I'm not suggesting that this is. Uh, a, um, obviously RNNs, there are forms of RNNs that are designed to kind of address this uh, issue, but it, it, it just points to, to one of the um, kind of, yeah, potential yeah. limitations already. But, um, but the kind of more interesting result then is if the, uh, this sequence follows an arbitrary pattern. And for the grid cell net, this essentially has um, no uh, influence on its performance, um, but for the other classifiers, um, it, uh, it clearly does. And um, and I mean, the, the kind of one thing that's worth noting is you can see, can, given uh, sufficient time and potentially examples, it looks like the, the RNN might be able to um, improve uh, and, and get up to a, a similar position. But, um, but this just kind of emphasizes again that the, the, the point of this system is to uh, emulate um, the capabilities of 
of some, you know, a human or a primate that can, with a uh, only handful of examples, uh, rapidly learn across these sequences, uh, rather than requiring um, thousands of training examples and <clears throat> thousands of uh, weight updates. You know, of course, in, 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 in um, you go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. In, in, in real vision, like a primate vision, human vision, uh, we don't do an arbitrary sequence. We, you know, where we fixate um, is, Definitely. is, is yeah. not, it's not a fixed and it's not, uh, it's not following some pattern. But we definitely pick out uh, the the brain picks out salient features or various types of things which are more likely that are more likely to lead to a better representation or a rapid um, uh, settle. Um, so so we, this is sort of a worst case scenario, uh, but it's yeah, as well. definitely. And it, so, so yeah, so the idea is that by the fact that the system can handle an arbitrary sequence means that given a a uh, kind of um, yeah a principled controller it could then take advantage of that flexibility. And, yeah, even if, uh, even if you just say, we're only gonna look at the elements that have a, you know, an edge in them. You know, <laughs> we're not gonna look at sections of the image that are, that are blank. You know, that would improve right. the performance dramatically just doing that. Okay, I, but anyway, I don't know if you had a question. So yeah, a couple of just details. In this case, um, was it an arbitrary input sequence during training as well as inference? Or did you fix the sequence during training? Uh, um, it was uh, arbitrary during training as well. Okay. Okay. And, and yeah, I'm because curious, I, what, well, my, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say my reasoning for that was um, that that would uh, be for the, to the benefit of um, the RNN, for example, because it would be a bit unfair if it had never seen a random sequence to, to then um, challenge it with that, where at least, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That's all. Can I have okay. a question? Um, yeah. For the RNN, did you feed it a representation of the location, or did you just feed it the sequence of the SDR? No, I just gave it a sequence. I did. I did consider, uh, yeah, whether, uh, yeah, it, it would be interesting to kind of say, okay, this is location sixteen, this is location twenty-two, or whatever, uh, as as an additional feature in itself. I did. I did consider that, and I I never had a chance to um, try it. My, my guess is it, it wouldn't have a huge impact, but it would be interesting to see, particularly if it's combined maybe with a, yeah, something like an LSTM um, that can uh, kind of use that information to, to maybe modulate gating and that sort of thing. Um, it would be interesting to see how far that goes to addressing this. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be kind of interesting, especially since the grid cell net does have some notion of location whereas none of the other ones do. Yeah, to make it a bit more of a level playing field. No, I, I agree. Yeah. But it's, it's a pretty level playing field. The RNN, if it were smart enough, it would just learn to represent locations. <laughs> so like it's, it, it is, <laughs> it is, it's a level playing field. I mean, they're both being given the same inputs. What, oh, unless the RNN's not receiving motor inputs. But anyway. Yeah, exactly. So I, either motor inputs or yeah, yeah it, cause it didn't receive those. So yeah, so maybe giving it the motor input would be another control test. I mean, uh, but yeah. even if that improved, the RNN did much better. It's still pointing out the importance of location, right? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. That's the whole point of this, right? So yeah, maybe there's different ways you can handle location or derive location, um, but uh, but you're still it's an important component. So I, I think yeah, I think what's potentially nice about the grid cells is the way it naturally generalizes to novel tasks rather than having to kind of learn this, potentially learn this mapping. Um, and, and the grids that, you know, you have this one epic versus a thousand epics. Um, you know, the grid cell net was on, is only given quote unquote one epic, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting, even in the fixed input sequence case, the one epic RNN is so much worse. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's despite kind of aggressively <laughs> tuning Aggressively yeah. tuning the learning rate to um, be as uh, as optimal as possible. Yeah. Um, so the so this kind of oh sorry, the the grid cell net it would be the equivalent of one epoch. How how do you how do you compare the training time between grid cells and RNNs? Yeah. Training time in uh, as in like number of passes. Kind of, it's just like one I mean, for the data set, right? Sorry, so could I... Is it just one pass through the data set? Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's impressive in and of itself, right? Um, yeah, because even kind of many examples of few shot training still provide the, the classifier as much time kind of as it wants to to learn from those five examples or whatever, uh, but it, but that's not necessarily very realistic um, from a biological point of view. Um, so this is uh, kind of uh, getting towards um, what you were talking about, Jeff. So um, what's kind of worth noting is that the system often achieves uh, or kind of uh, converges to its, its classification uh, before it's sampled the entire input space. Uh, and so what this is showing is that uh, as a function of the, of the kind of number of sensory inputs, um, what is the, the accuracy of the, the classifier? Um, and as you can see, after kind of less than 10 sensations, uh, the majority of classes that the system is going to classify correctly uh, are, are already classified. Um, and then this is just comparing it to uh, k-nearest neighbor um, with the, uh, so in both of these cases, it's with the, the arbitrary input. And as you can kind of see, the uh, KNN is, is essentially constrained to just key off uh, the kind of uh, key features that were, or kind of key information that was already present in a, in a single representation. It doesn't really gain much um, from additional um, information. I assume you're excluding, then, you're preventing the same sensory inputs to occur twice in the in the twenty five. Yes, that's yeah, that's already in the uh, system. Yeah. Okay. But it could be getting completely black inputs or yes. inputs with yeah. only one or two pixels in. Um, yeah. It's it, it's but, um, on, yeah. Yeah, but then the the kind of this has two benefits uh, or potential benefits downstream. Um, so one of them is to control, which I'll talk about later. And then the other is uh, the predictive nature of the system, which is that um, because the, the system is constantly making predictions, um, this can actually be uh, visualized. Uh, and in particular, once it's kind of performed classification, uh, even if it, let's say it's performed classification at this point, the system can fill in uh, what it thinks uh, would be present in the rest of the image, even though it hasn't yet uh, observed that. Uh, and so in order to do this, um, the idea is that, uh, so bearing, bearing in mind these kind of regions, it's not being fed in a, at a, a, as a pixel patch, it's being fed in as these kind of abstract, um, abstract uh, regions, uh, feature regions. But, um, but anyways, the idea is to kind of, um, there's the, the sensed input uh, and then the, the next predicted input that the, the classifier has. Uh, and it receives uh, progressive sensations, always predicting uh, another sensation up until um, inference is successful. And once inference is successful, uh, we assume that there are no further kind of input sensations uh, and that the rest of the image is tiled with blue. So the predictions of the system. The, um, these actual kind of sequence of sensed and predicted um, uh, features can be taken from the system and fed to a decoder. So a neural network that's been trained uh, separately on um, these SDR features to reconstruct uh, the input image. Um, okay. And, uh, oh, oh, sorry. I can interrupt before you go on. Uh, on that plot, oh. is that, are those results average over several random sequences? And if so, is the variance big or small? On the plot, on the... Uh, yeah, they they they're not. Um, you mean as in um, different? So, for example, depending on a particular arbitrary sequence, the uh, classifier might recognize it after five sensations or fifteen sensations, and and of course those will be different uh, samples. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So so in the the plot you showed in the previous slide is that an average over several runs. No, this is, yeah, uh, I'm definitely going to do that in, in the future, but, uh, but so far this is just a single um, run. Okay, and you, and you do observe a lot of variance then, right? If, if you were to plot like an average, you would have like big uh, lower and upper bounds there, a big uh, confidence interval there, right? The question is, would that blue line change a lot under different runs? Is that what you're asking? Exactly. And, and what would the error bars look like, I think? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but um, I mean, uh, I'm yeah, I'm not sure at this point, but um, but yeah, I don't think it would necessarily be 
uh, that large the error bars. Okay. Yeah, I would think so too. I think it would be modest. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, no, no worries. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing I can say is I, um, so this is from, uh, so also I had to decide, you know, how many examples. This is when it's been trained with five examples per uh, image. Um, but, you know, I briefly plotted the other ones and they had similar curves. Uh, it wasn't anything kind of- I mean, you could, you could hand pick a bunch of a, a, a sequence that would perform very poorly. Um, you know, just pick all the black areas around the outside of the image or something like that. Um, but it seems like it, once you start randomly sampling, it would be, it would probably be pretty good. Yeah, so, um, but anyway, so then uh, predicting these, um, the kind of representation in the system. So what that's showing me here, so a lot of these uh, kind of features that are being fed to the decoder are just vectors of zeros. <clears throat> and then the, this kind of highlighted window is telling us where the system is currently predicting. So the, the kind of next uh, sequence. So you can see, for example, here it's predicting this location. Now it's predicting here, whereas this is now the, the ground truth sensation it's received. But, um, but at this point, it's uh, successfully inferred the image, which this isn't necessarily always the case, but at least in these examples appears to kind of approximately coincide with when a, a human might be uh, reasonably confident about the, uh, the class. Um, and then uh, the system can kind of fill in the rest of the space with uh, its predictions alone. And then um, this kind of fill in is based on a uh, prior learned example, which in some cases can be uh, quite close to uh, the ground truth. Um, and, uh, but what's interesting to know is, so I'm showing examples where uh, the, at inference time, the system has uh, converged to a single uh, representation of uh, a single location representation. Sometimes at inference, it's a, a union of location representations, uh, particularly for uh, digits such as two, which uh, I believe have more variance in how they're written. So some people do twos with like a loop at the bottom, for example. Some people do them with a, a, a kind of a flat bottom um, to the two. And, um, and the decoder, because it's only been trained on uh, examples of single um, SDRs, uh, it's uh, unable to to kind of deal with these. So that's a, another kind of future thing uh, to do would be to uh, train it on these uh, unions and see uh, what the outputs look like. It could be interesting if this is actually a way of the system to kind of given a uh, an unfamiliar uh, representation, use a union to uh, encode um, uh, kind of uh, almost interpolate between two uh, known examples to get closer to the input. You know, when I was, do um, when I was doing alternatively, oh, sorry. When I was, when I was doing uh, handwriting recognition software, one of the things, a simple observation we came across is that the way people write letters can be completely different. And therefore you can't generalize. You can't generalize between one person's letter of a, I don't know, pick a, I can't remember the specific examples now, like an, like a, an E or something, and another person. So they're just literally different. There's there's nothing. So you, essentially, your brain has to classify them as saying, "Oh, that's a separate uh, object that I know, but I'm giving it the same class." So it, it's a it's a fallacy to you don't want to fall into the trap of trying to say, "Well, this I'm trying to figure out what's common between all these different ways that people write a six. It, it may not be anything common. I, I'm not saying that applies here, but the general principle applies. And handwriting that you can write these, like you said, the two, they can they really separate characters, and we and our brain learns them separately, and then we assign them to the same class. But Which is sort of what's going on here as well, because it's 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 kind of memorized a bunch of different examples, and it figures out which example it's closest to, and starts predicting based on that. Yeah, but you can't expect it to be trained on one type of two, and. Um, uh, and in some sense, you can't train it on the different types of twos uh, and, and combine yeah, it that training. Know, it, yeah, it won't know that all of those twos are similar in some sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just yeah. have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about these things. So Niels, I think this is a really cool result and, and picture. It's just, I think the, the image itself might be really confusing to people. Like, I'm not sure mm -hmm. exactly, like what's, what, what, you know, why are you starting at sensation two, not at sensation one? And what is what exactly is this square, and where where has it looked before, and where has it not looked before? It's yeah. just a little hard to tell from this examples. So yeah, think, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna in the, in the write-up. I'm gonna include uh, the previous sorry. slide was a lot clearer. Um, right. You know, so if you use the same was, kind of color squares and stuff in here, then it'll be really clear. I yeah. Think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Partly, this was just a hack for myself to be able to see what the system is doing when I'm looking at these images, rather than it necessarily being a great way of um, making a publication ready figure. Yeah. Um, oh, I, yeah. I agree. It's interesting because I, I, I skipped right over that. Your point's well taken, but I thought the result was really fascinating. <laughs> so, so yeah, really, no, I think the result is great. Uh, I think so, the result is great. So <laughs> it's like, you know, you go from the first red square to the second red square and you say, okay, well, for whatever, wherever it sends, that's what it knows. And then this is what it's predicting. And um, so I, I think you don't want to obscure that that transition between the, those last three squares, the ground truth and the two, and the two red squares. You don't want to obscure that with the with the little boxes, but but maybe you could do both somehow, you know, just do a subtle little thing or something. Yeah. Uh, you showed some uh, results on the, so there are two parts of this. One is classification and the other is reconstru reconstruction. And you showed some results on classification. We also have uh, results on reconstruction and how it compares to other uh, alternatives like out encoder or anything like that. Um. I'm just thinking how you would actually compare that. Um, Isn't there some sort of performance measure like compare it to the ground? Oh. Yeah, but the, the issue is um, the, the, because there's kind of two different components to it. There's the, there's going from the SDR representation to the, um, to the image, which is actually what the decoder is doing. So I can't really compare that in a sense to an autoencoder because yeah. it, it's using an autoencoder. Oh. Um, but it, so it's more, uh, so for example, one comparison might be uh, to train an RNN on the kind of first 12 sensa sensations and for it to predict uh, the last 13 and then see how that compares. Oh. Um, that, that's kind of one way of doing it. But um, yeah, I ultimately didn't do it partly because of time, but partly because, yeah, it felt unsatisfying. Part of, part of what makes the system interesting is the number of sensations before prediction starts taking place is, is yeah, is is varies. It's it's not a fixed quantity. Mm. Whereas again, generally, um, yeah, often a, a train system will expect a, cer a certain number of um, sequences. Although I, I guess that's not necessarily the case. So yeah, it, it's definitely possible to maybe compare them. But um, but yeah, it's not something I've done. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's the the kind of uh, the last of the uh, results. So then, kind of tying this all um, kind of together. So one, um, I mentioned that you know this idea of kind of making do with uh, fewer sensations than than the maximum possible is interesting from a predictive point of view. But as kind of alluded to at the start of this, and and by Jeff, it's also interesting from the point of view of uh, an embodied agent, uh, which. As kind of noted earlier, you don't want to be doing a, a raster scan or whatever. You want to be able to uh, intelligently sample the input. And so this would definitely be uh, an interesting um, area for future work, I think, to actually combine this with, uh, for example, a reinforcement learning agent uh, that learns to control the, um, the uh, motor uh, outputs uh, in such a way that it uh, efficiently recognizes uh, digits rather than doing a, an arbitrary order. Uh, the other kind of interesting um, situation where it would uh, it would be, uh, yeah, where I'd like to kind of see how the system uh, performs is translation invariance. Uh, so interestingly, translation invariance, uh, despite you know CNNs being uh, built from the ground up in, in a sense to to have some translation invariance, are actually uh, very poor at it, as are other. Um, quite kind of, you know, complex systems that are trying to uh, create more invariant representations, including capsule networks and uh, the analysis by synthesis um, generative model. So it's um, even on MNIST, uh, so this is from the corrupted MNIST uh, data set, even on MNIST, uh, translation invariance is, is far from a, a solved problem. This system at the kind of, um, at, the, at the sort of the grid cell level, at the, at the, um, at the, the column network level, is 
uh, really by design should be quite robust to translation invariance because it's it's performing object recognition in the reference frame of the object, and so um, so uh, should work quite well. The difficulty then is feeding in the appropriate features because at the moment <clears throat> the uh, system for generating the SDRs is itself not uh, neither translation invariant nor equivariant. So uh, the kind of downstream uh, system won't be able to um, Neil, make appropriate use of Neil, it. Let me just make sure I understand this. I mean, it seems to be the problem here is that the way you've implemented it, correct me if I'm wrong, is your reference frame is anchored to the, to, to the, to the entire image, not to the object. And is, is that-, is that, uh, that be shouldn't be, I, I don't think that should be so much of an issue. Um, because um, because ult ultimately, like if we imagine in, in an ideal situation, um, if this if this shift in three was fed in, then imagine that all of the uh, SDRs uh, in that five by five grid would shift over, say by one, and then that would be fed into the the classifier. It it should be able to um, to but handle that fine. But aren't the locations are the aren't the locations relative to the overall Im image space and not to the object? No, I think um, I think it's just it's fixed to the object. It's it's all yeah. sort of relative. Okay, I'm, uh, I missed that. That's what you want. Location. So I missed that though. Yeah. So I don't, I don't exactly. Miss. So I mean, it's 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 just the because it's it's just learned how the yeah the 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 features will relate to one another as it travels through the the kind of grid cell location representation. So uh, if if a particular feature is active, it doesn't matter if it was learned in this location, but it's presented in this location, it will know that by moving. Okay. It's know, all, it all it knows about our relative shifts. Uh, exactly. Okay, I, I guess uh, I'll have to think about that a little bit more. But, well, then, but, then, then you should have translation invariance. Yeah. It should work pretty well. Yeah, you should have it. Exactly. I, it, the only, it, the, it should the one work. issue is uh, one, I mean, in terms of reference frames uh, relating to our previous uh, research meeting, it, there's no notion of rotation or, or yeah. scale or anything yeah. else. It's just yeah. purely yeah. 2D shifts that it can yeah. handle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely at the moment it's, yeah, just 2D shifts, but yeah. The, the, the difficulty is how the, the features are fed in and, and also just the, um, this idea of going from kind of a, a relatively continuous input space, 28 by 28 pixels to a, a very discrete uh, input space of five by five, um, again, has its own problems. So um, that would definitely need to be resolved before this question could be properly addressed. But, um, but I think this would be another really interesting uh, avenue for future research. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in summary, um, using these kind of grid cells uh, definitely seems to offer some tangible benefits uh, for um, what is a, a challenging task, these kind of arbitrary sequences. Um, and, and the fact that this works on uh, actual images suggests that it, it could be something that um, the, uh, the primate brain might use. But uh, I would say the, the kind of the main limitation so far is that the the method I use to uh, derive these SDRs is, is quite contrived. I'm feeding in the entire image at once, even though I'm then later uh, feeding in a sequence of kind of patches. Um, so that doesn't uh, kind of hang together um, very elegantly. Uh, and it also then has limitations for um, the questions that can be asked, such as, is the system translation invariant? Um, the other kind of limitation is then, uh, you know, this is, MNIST is the simplest of all visual data sets. Um, so I think uh, what would be great in kind of future work would be to see whether uh, a more challenging test like OmniGlot could be, um, particularly given that the system uh, seems to excel within the kind of few shot uh, domain, uh, whether OmniGlot um, could be, um, could be uh, tackled and uh, whether some sort of kind of patchwise feature extraction um, would resolve some of these issues, which is uh, something I experimented with, but uh, wasn't able to get a, a kind of satisfactory working solution in the, in the time available. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. Any other questions? I thought it was great. I was really uh, both nice, nice uh, approach to the whole problem, nice, uh, process so you went through it very interesting results and a great presentation uh, so kudos, kudos all around thanks very much i don't know what other people thought but <laughs>
<laughs> I'm I'm impressed that you managed to add generalization to this model. Uh, that that scared the heck out of me, and it's cool that you got something working <laughs> that does that. It's I mean, scared. in in some sense, I think I was I was lucky because um, it was yeah, it was quite a simple approach I took in the end, but uh, but it managed to work. <laughs> You were scared, Marcus, because you thought it may not work. <laughs> right. Well, sure. So the the paper as is, uh, like uh, we trained it on specific instances of objects, basically, and and then recognized those objects. Uh, so the the fact that he got this, where he's training, where he's recognizing novel um, n digits, that I wasn't sure that would work at all. And and it, and it's cool that it did. It's cool that he pulled it off. Yeah, I agree. <laughs>